speak at the podium or speak here or speak there and then maybe answer a few questions from mm -hmm. here. Uh, good morning. I'm Mike Van Dusen, Deputy Director of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, uh, Dr. Park, uh, Ambassador um, Lee Taishik, um, and guests. On behalf of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, its Board of Trustees, and President Lee Hamilton, who could not be here because he was called to a meeting at the White House, I want to give you all a hearty welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars the official and living memorial to our 28th president. We are here this morning for two purposes. To hear Dr. J.Q. Park, the president of Ki Yung Nam University, speak, and also to help inaugurate important collaboration between the Woodrow Wilson Center and Ki Yung Nam's university's graduate school of North Korean studies. I would also like to acknowledge the support of the Korea Foundation and its DC office director, Ki Young Chow Park, for helping to make this collaboration possible. The foundation is supporting the North Korea International Documentation Project and also career-related activities of the center's very active Asia program. At the Woodrow Wilson Center, Dr. Osterman, who runs our history and public policy program, Dr. Hathaway, who runs our Asia program, um, both ably assisted by Ka uh, Dr. Catherine Weathersby and, and uh, Mark Moore, are all involved in and dedicated to ensuring that this collaboration with the Graduate School of North Korean Studies um, is a big success. The Wilson Center is a public-private institution raising some government funding um, receiving some government funding, but raising more than half the resources we need from non-appropriated and private sources. The center's mission is to bring together the thinkers and the doers, the scholars and the policy makers, the academics and the business practitioners, in the confident hope that from their dialogue on public policy issues, each will learn from the other. The work of both will be uh, enriched in better understanding and better policy will emerge. As the only president we have had who had a doctorate, Woodrow Wilson spoke eloquently to the challenges and the benefits of bringing these two worlds together. Through more than 600 meetings a year and the presence of 150 scholars during the year, the center's work and scholarship commemorates the ideals and concerns of Woodrow Wilson. The, uh, the center's outreach extends conversations at the center worldwide through publishing, broadcasting, and internet programs. Many programs like today's are being webcast. The center does not develop specific policy recommendations and does not represent any consensus of thought or beliefs. Rather, it is a nonpartisan center for advanced studies, a neutral and civil forum for free, serious, and informed dialogue. We try to separate the important from the inconsequential and to take a historical perspective on the issues and to put them in a broader context. No one attending a center's meetings would be sympathized with all the opinions expressed, but everyone will sympathize with some of them. Our aim is to inform the public dialogue with a broad, 
hospitality to many different views. We believe in the magic of dialogue, and that is at the heart of representative democracy. It is a distinct honor for the Woodrow Wilson Center to welcome Dr. J. Q. Park. Dr. Park had education in New Jersey. Indeed, he spent seven years uh, studying in the United States. He graduated from Fairleigh Dickinson University and got a master's degree from City University of New York before completing his doctorate in Korea. Dr. Park is a distinguished scholar of North Korea. Having, himself, having devoted himself to the study of North Korea since the 1970s, he has served as president of, K, of, of Ki Yongnam University since 1986, where he founded the prestigious Graduate School of North Korean Studies. Very much in the Wilsonian tradition, Dr. Park is both a scholar and a policymaker. Dr. Park served with distinction as a former Minister of Unification of Korea, a post he held from 1999 to 2001 under uh, President Kim, uh, Kim Dae-jung. In that important assignment, he was a key figure in putting together the historic June 2000 summit between Kim Dae-jung and his North Korean counterpart, counterpart Kim Jong-il. The first summit ever held between the two Korean states, it prepared the ground for the transformation in inter-Korean relations, the subject of his remarks today. Dr. Park will speak on North Korea since the year 2000 and the prospects for inter-Korean relations. Dr. Park, welcome to the center. The floor is yours. Good morning, the Honorable uh, Dr. Michael Ben Dawson, uh, Korean Ambassador Lee Tesik, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to have this opportunity to address the world-renowned Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I would like to thank the Honorable Lee Hamilton uh, the director of the center for inviting me to this forum. I would also like to thank Dr. Christian Ostman, Dr. Catherine Weathersby, I don't know whether I pronounce your name right, or, and the, the Dr. Robert uh, Hesway for making collaboration between this center and the Gyeongnam University Graduate School Center possible. My topic today is North Korea since 2000 and the prospect for inter-Korean relations. The reason why I have chosen 2000 as point of departure is that in June of that year, historic inter-Korean summit occurred. I had the privilege of saving, serving as the cabinet member in charge of each preparation on Seoul's side. That summit, I believe, not only helped to open a new era in inter-Korean relations, but also accelerated the pace of change in North Korea itself. Change in North Korea can be discerned not in the structure of power, but in policy output. Structurally, the leader-dominated system has proven, proved to be strictly resilient, even though Kim Jong-il's official titles do not include state president, a position the North reserves exclusively for his late father, Kim Il-sung. Kim Jong-il's grip on power is beyond the challenge. What is new is the conspicuous ascendancy of the military in the post-Kim Il-sung North. One indicator of this is Kim Jong-il's choice of titles for himself. Two of the three options, positions he occupies are military, the chairman of the National Defense Commission and the supreme commander of Korean People's Army. Also noteworthy is Kim's adoption of first military first policy as the guiding policy of his regime. That policy officially 
elevates the military to the supreme repository of power, gives it the highest priority in resource allocation, and upholds it as the model to be emulated by all North Korean citizens. All this, however, predated the 2000 summit of the policies that materialized in the post-summit period. The most noteworthy may be the economic reform measures the North Korea adopted on July 1, 2002. The measures promulgated on July 1 focused on price reform and the reform of enterprise management. In the ensuing months, the North has adopted additional measures dealing with reforms in commercial, agricultural, and external economic relations. Also stopping short of price liberalization, the North has endeavored to deal with the problem of price distortion by abolishing subs subsidizes and making prices approximate those set by the market. In market reform, the North has introduced multi-purpose market for consumers for the first time, thereby legal, legalizing black market. Second, tried to enhance the role of market in the planned economy. And third, begun to see market as beneficial rather than uh, detrimental to the maintenance of its political system. The North has also decided to establish special district in Shiniju, Gumgang Mountain, and Gaesung with the aim of inducing South Korean and foreign investment. Concurrently, the North has liberalized and amended laws and regulations pertaining to external economic relations. Of the special district, Gumgang Mountain and Gaesung continue to grow while Shiniju project remains in limbo. Tourism also continues to grow and diversify since establishment in November 1998 of the scenic Gumgang Mountain Resort, a tourist resort. The number of South Korean tourists reached the one million mark in June last year. Gaesung is also growing. A model complex has been completed and certain South Korean firms have completed the construction of their facilities. Eleven are already selling wares made by North Korean hands. The North's gradual transition to what it calls pragmatic socialism has nonetheless entailed the spread not only of capitalist ideas, but of foreign culture as well. Although productivity has improved in some industries, the paucity of resources has emerged as a severe constraint. Agriculture, light industry, and other labor-intensive industries have seen some improvement in productivity. The, in agricultural policy, the North appears to be replicating the early Chinese experiment in allowing de facto private ownership on limited basis. The effect of the economic reform measures, however, have been severely limited by the exhaustions of investment capital and the crippling sh shortages of energy and raw materials. Inflation is rampant, and gap between rich and poor widening in the north, both of which have the potential to precipitate conflict. Hyperinflation has spawned a new class of urban poor in the north and aggravated the suffering, sufferings of ordinary citizens. When this is combined with pervasive corruption, and increasing crime rates, social instability is unavoidable. The recent reinstatement of grain rationing 
can be viewed as a response to the problems that have arisen from combination of inflation and rising discontent of those who have not benefited from economic changes noted above. Despite or perhaps because of all this, the regime has neither loosened the control of its people nor diminished political indoctrination. There are, however, unmistakable signs of generational shift among the North's North elite. Those in their 40s and 50s are more conspicuous in the ranks of top-level leaders in government, the armed forces, and the state enterprises. The North Korean leaders appear to be well informed about the outside world. Chairman Kim Jong-il of the Defense Minister Commission listens to or watches South Korean and even foreign broadcasts. CNN, BBC, and virtual all major foreign channels are available to him and to other top leaders. Kim told me that he read South Korean newspapers and has read my own essays and the columns in them. One difference I noticed during my latest visit in June last year was that the aura of supreme self-confidence I witnessed in 2000 seemed to be either absent or markedly muted. Chairman Kim Jong-il seemed to be well informed about a wide range of subjects, and his understanding of international affairs struck me as excellent. In so far as decision-making on important issues is concerned, his authority appears to be, to be beyond challenge. The speculation that there is a conflict between hardliners and moderators in the North, or that the military has excessive amount of power, should not distract us from overriding reality. That is, Kim Jong-il is absolute ruler of the North. North. Nothing important gets accomplished without his instructions. The probability of military coup is exceedingly low. All key decisions in other world are made at the top with Kim Jong-il at its core. However, the stability or persistence of the regime may have contributed to economic crisis. The shortage of resources, the isolation from international community, the inertia of a political system, these may be the underlying causes of North's, North's predicament. In foreign policy, one sees both continuity and change, with former eclipsing the latter. The foremost, foremost strategic goals in Pyongyang's foreign policy continue to be legitimacy, security, and development. Legitimacy and the security are intertwined, for they are both geared to the preservation of Kim Jong-il's regime in what it perceives as hostile environment. With economic woes, still bedeviling the country. Moreover, the goal of development has realistically been scaled down to survival. Officially, however, the North has set its sight on building a powerful and pros <coughs> prosperous country, Gangseng Daeguk in Korean. Change in Pyongyang's foreign policy can be detected primarily on the tactical level. A prominent example is Kim Jong-il's admission to Japanese Prime Minister Koizumi in September 2002. That North Korean agent had kidnapped Japanese nationals in the 70s and 80s. Even more surprising was his apology to Koizumi for what had happened. DPRK-US relations reached a high point in the immediate aftermath of the Inter-Korean summit. In October 2000, 
Vice Marshal Jo Meng Nok became the first North Korean official ever to visit White House for a meeting with U.S. President. A joint communique issued at the end of his visit proclaimed that two countries would put an end to their hostile relations. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright visited Pyongyang a month later and held talks with Kim Jong-il. Washington and Pyongyang almost agreed on a summit meeting in 2000, and informal remarks on North Korean leaders indicate that they still regret the missed opportunity. They want a peaceful coexistence and normalization of relations with the U.S. in order to fortify their national security and to accelerate the revitalization of their economy. The advent of George W. Bush administration in January 2001, however, assured in a period of discord and confrontation, leading to a standoff over the nuclear issue beginning in October 2002. Bush's hardline stance, coupled with official name calling and the personal attacks aimed at Kim Jong il, led to North Korea's refusal to cooperate, repeated boycott or postponement of meeting, and stepped up rhetoric aimed at driving a wedge between U.S. and South Korea. After three rounds of unsuccessful six party talks and over years passing before fourth round could be convened, a joint statement has emerged that has potential to break new ground. Inter-Korean relations, by contrast, have proved to be immune from change of government in Seoul. The Romuyan government has embraced the sunshine policy of his predecessor and actually expanded it. As a result, multifaceted exchanges have steadily grown. The total number of people visiting North and South tripled between 2000 and 2004. Most of this traffic, however, is one way. In 2005, for example, South Korean visitors to North exceeded 28,000, but North Korean visitors to the South totaled a mere 1,071. This doesn't include South Korean tourists to Gumgang Mountain, who vastly outnumber other visitors. At the governmental level, cabinet level meetings have been held 17 times since the June 2000 uh, summit. In recent years, two decisions have been holding intergovernmental or cushy governmental, such as Red Cross meetings, two or three times a month on average. Inter-Korean trade has steadily grown to the level of about 700 million a year. In 2001, South Korea replaced Japan as North Korea's largest trading partner, accounting from 22.3% of the latter's total external trade. Last year, inter-Korean trade surpassed 1 billion for the first time. The North's economic dependence on the South is greater in non-trade terms, notably humanitarian assistance. In 2005, the South's humanitarian and other assistance to North totaled 385 million, including half million tons of rice on a deferred payment basis, which was worth 150 million. The South, in fact, has provided 300,000 tons of fertilizer and 400,000 tons of food to the North every year since the uh, 2000 summit. The successful conclusion of fourth round of six-party talks in Beijing in September last year, in which Seoul played an active role, suggested that 
economic and other exchanges between two Koreas can help enhance the security of the Korean Peninsula. However, the North continues to pursue the strategy of trying to persuade the South to place North-South cooperation ahead of Korea-US alliance, arguing that Minjok, uh, in Korean, in English, uh, nation identity, should take precedence over relations with foreigners, while Nomuyan government has thus far refused to heed the passionate appeal emanating from the North, some segment of South Korean population, notably the youth, organized labor, and radical element, find the North Korean rhetoric appealing. One cannot overemphasize the importance of ROK-US alliance for the stability of Korean Peninsula and the peace of Northeast Asia. The problems on the Korean Peninsula have direct implications for the lives of Korean people, which may help explain why, why Seoul and Washington do not always see eye to eye on important issues. During the Cold War era, the ROK and the US were united in their support of pressure and containment vis-a-vis -vis the North European, Eastern, Eastern Europe and other countries in socialist camp. As already mentioned, the Pyongyang su summit opened a new page in the annals inter-Korean relations of inter-Korean inter relations. Five years after the summit, the current South Korean government is pursuing a policy of reconciliation and cooperation for peaceful unification which the majority of South Korean people support. Seoul's attempt to pursue both ROK-US collaboration and inter-Korean reconciliation and cooperation inevitably gave rise to discord in the former. Following summit meeting in 2005, however, the ROK and the US have put their relations back on track. Mutual understanding and uh, collaboration have increased measurably. No matter what some of opinions poll conducted in the South may show an overwhelming, overwhelming majority of South Korean people appreciate the value of ROK-US alliance. A recent poll conducted by Dong Ailbo, a leading daily in Seoul, found that the help of Respondent in their 20s had chosen U.S. as the most important country in Seoul's diplomacy, while only 10% of them had chosen North Korea. Overall, the poll strongly suggested that the majority of today's youth in South Korea tended to be pragmatic and not ideologically hostile to the U.S., to most South Koreans, in other words, the threat from the North has not dissipated but remains intact as long as it clings to its nuclear weapons development program. To attain the goal of nuclear weapons free Korean Peninsula, Seoul must work closely with the U.S. within framework of six-party talks. Cross collaboration between Seoul on the one hand and the Tokyo, Beijing, and Moscow on the other is indispensable. Seoul needed to further strengthen its cooperative relations with Beijing, having invested considerable energy and reputation in the six party talks. China has high stake in ensuring that they continue and eventually succeed. The momentum of steadily increasing inter-Korean exchanges and cooperation cannot be sustained unless the North Korean nuclear issue is peacefully resolved. The adoption of joint statement at the 
fourth round of six party talks marks a turning point in the quest for resolution of the issue. In this joint statement, the six parties reaffirmed the goal of non nuclear Korean Peninsula and the North agreed to abandon all nuclear weapons and existing nuclear programs, return to the MPT and allow IAEA inspections at early date. The U.S. reaffirmed its recognition of North Korean sovereignty and agreed to take steps toward normalizing relations, reiterating that there was no U.S. intent to attack the U.S. with nuclear or conventional weapons. The DPRK and the Japan made a similar statement regarding normalization, and all parties agreed to continue discussions on the provision of energy, trade, and investment in order to promote security and peace in the region. Since details need to be worked, and since many pitfalls remain in trying to imp implement the broad principles in enumer enumerated in the joint statement, however much work remains to be done. The joint statement also recognized North Korea's right to peaceful nuclear energy. The North lost no time in declaring uh, that it should not abandon its nuclear weapons program, nor take any steps toward that goal until U.S. provided light world nuclear reactor to North Korea first. Although the U.S. has been staunchly opposed to this, the ambiguous wording of agreement has left the door open to divergent interpretations. Ana another op potentially contentious issue pertains to North Korea's agreement to abandon all existing nuclear programs. Since the U.S. insists that North has covered uranium enrichment program, an accu accusation denied by Pyongyang, controversy over this discrepancy is inevitable. The resumption of six-party talks in Beijing on November 9, however, may have aggravated the situation. The talks recessed after three days without setting a firm date for their resumption. Not only do the basic positions of two main protagonists, the U.S. North Korea, remain, pol remain poles apart, but the latter accused the former of poisoning the atmosphere of negotiation by imposing economic sanctions on laws, <coughs> including those on banks in the former Portuguese colony of Macau, with which Pyongyang has close links. The North also cited President Bush's reference to Kim Jong-il as tyrant a few days before the first session of fifth round opened, calling it a violation of joint statement adopted by fourth round of the talks. The U.S. allegation of counterfeiting by the North of $100 bills has emerged <coughs> as a newborn of contention threatening to derail the six-party process. However, North Korea does have more to gain than lose from peaceful resolution of current standoff. Its dire economic situation means that it is no, in no condition to risk a war. Economic cooperation with the South, Japan, and China will hinge on the absence of major disturbance. Many believe that North recognizes the benefit of engagement with Washington and is sincere in its overtures toward the latter. Coercive measures such as large-scale sanctions and interdiction of DPRK ships as part of a proliferation security in initiative have the potential to trigger a major conflict. A 
a key issue it is. Is North Korea prepared to give up its nuclear weapons program completely and in a verifiable manner? Or is it merely interested in extracting maximum concessions from US, South Korea, and Japan while buying more time to fortify its nuclear deterrent? The North is mostly likely serious about wanting to exchange its nuclear card for security guarantees and economic benefits. That is the formula outlined in the joint statement noted above. In my view, does it meet the North's tr true needs and desires? If Seoul's offer, to, o offer of 2 million kilowatts of electricity to the North did indeed make a difference in inducing North to return to the long stalled six party talks. It means that Seoul is now in position to play an important role in the resolution of a nuclear issue. What is most important for Seoul, however, is to avoid publicly taking side with Pyongyang in opposition to Washington. Seoul must always take pains to iron out its differences with Washington beyond closed doors. Seoul's engagement with the North is essential to easing tensions in the region and alleviating the DPRK's dire economic conditions. It is, however, far from sufficient. Aid from Japan is expected to eclipse that all of that all of all other players once relations are normalized between Tokyo and Pyongyang. More important, both North and South Korea need strong support from Washington as the U.S. approval for international development funding is essential. The North's heavy dependence on the South gives the latter leverage in negotiation, both bilateral and multilateral. Seoul's leverage on, over Pyongyang may be second only to the death of Beijing. If South Korea plays its hand well as a leading provider of humanitarian and other assistance to North Korea, while at the same time encouraging the cooperation and the constructive involvement of all other players, the prospect for peace on the Korean Peninsula will improve measurably. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Park, for a very comprehensive uh, statement. Um, Dr. Catherine Weather Weathersby, who is, uh, works with the uh, History and Public Policy Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center and has uh, played a key role in developing contacts with the Graduate School of North Korean Studies at, um, at Dr. Park's university uh, will handle the question period. Uh, Dr. Park has graciously agreed to answer a few questions. Catherine. Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, welcome to all of you. It's, it's good to have you here. Um, we do have um, about 20 minutes for some questions, uh, and Dr. Park will uh, give his answers in Korean, and we have an interpreter here. Uh, please raise your hand. We have mics on either side of the auditorium, and uh, so please wait until the mic gets to you. Bob? Please you. identify yourself. Um, Bob Hathaway here at the Wilson Center. DPRK, Dr. Pak, is, of course, uh, an enigma to most of us. Uh, you clearly know it better than uh, most South Koreans, let alone Americans. I wonder if you have any views on the reports which have been coming out of North Korea in recent months to the effect that Pyongyang is backing off from the economic reforms which you mentioned, uh, which had been initiated in 2002. Um, credible news reports uh, suggest that um, Pyongyang is, is abandoning those reforms, that the uh, free market sale of food grains has been discontinued. 
um, and that it's back to uh, business as usual uh, pre-2002. Uh, since you were there just a few months ago, perhaps you can share your thoughts uh, and observations with us on, on this matter. Uh, uh, you know, uh, English is my na not native, so I'll uh, need his help mm -hmm. to give you a better answer. Yes. Uh, yes. 실은 그 2000년 남북 정상회담 이후에 uh, 김정일 위원장이 uh, 북한의 경제 를좀회복시키기위해서남쪽뿐만아니고외국에이자본을좀유치해야된다그런결론을내리면서나온게7일2002년7일경제조치입니다조금전에말씀대로그조치가지난20년2 3년동안에아주하이인플레이션그리고그다음에또여러가지외국인그투자가되지않음으로해서어려움에봉착했습니다그래서지금그7일경제조치와그이외후속의여러가지리폼그이조치들이그냥없어진게아니고지금일단중단시키놓고어떤보완책을지금내놓는준비를하고있습니다그래서머지않아서외국인들투자를위한또지난7일경제새조치를더성공적으로이끌어가기위한보완책을아마꼭내놓을거다저는그렇게생각합니다In year 2000, as you well know, and as the result of the summit meeting, uh, the chairman, Mr. Kim Jong-il, decided that there is a need for uh, certain measures to be taken in the economic area. And as a result of that, uh, the statement, uh, which was made in July 1st of 2002, came out, uh, which uh, sought for investment from overseas, including South Korea. And since then, for two or three years, uh, there had been certain problems that the North Korean economy had faced. Uh, this included high, high, high inflation and also certain problems with investment. They weren't getting enough investment as they had hoped for. So uh, as to your question, it's not that the uh, economic measures have been discontinued at this point, but I think the better, better wording would be that temporarily this is at a seizure. So they are looking for other measures uh, to complement and complete the economic reforms that they have initiated. And uh, I think in a uh, uh, near date, not too far from now, uh, we, we should have a more of a uh, complementing measurement uh, to the economic uh, reforms that were initiated. Thank you very much. In the center, right here. Please identify yourself. Yeah. I'm Jenny Park with the USA Journal. Yes, Dr. Right. Park, North Korean leader Kim Jong-il is known to be now under an official visit to China. Can you tell us what would be the purpose on his visit, if any? Thank you. I'm going to ask you a question about Kim jong il 어, 중국의 후진타워 어, 이 주석이 에, 에, 해야 될것 같습니다. 에, 그러나 제가 이, 어, 뭐 생각하기로는 아마 이분의 만약에 김정일 위원장이 지금 뉴스에 나온 것처럼 어, 북경을 어, 방문 중이라면 또 후진타워의 주석하고 만난다면 아마 두 가지 이야기가 오갈 거 아닌가 하나는 어, 지난 수년 동안에 북한이 중국에다 요청한 경제 지원 그걸 좀 어, 빠른 시일 내에 어, 이, 그 지원해 주면 좋겠다는 그런 SOS를 보낼 것 그, 어, 같고 그 다음 두 번째로는 그 지난 육자회담 그 공동 그 합의물 내놓고도 지금 그이 이 북미 간에 그런 어, 여러 가지 문제 때문에 수톱 상태에 있기 때문에 이거를 좀 빠른 시일 내에 회복시키는 그런 그냥 어, 설득을 오히려 어, 후진타워가 뭐 하는 그런 장소가 될거 아닌가 어, 
그렇습니다. Uh, as to the exact nature of the visit, uh, I think uh, only Mr. Chairman Kim Jong Il and President Hu Jintao would be uh, give you would you, would be able to give you the answer to that. Uh, and also, uh, as to the actual meeting that's taking place, uh, as reported in the media, if I were to guess as to what the uh, conversation might be between Hu Jintao and uh, Chairman Kim. Uh, I would think that following two topics may be the, dis may be the topics of discussion. The first one would be uh, coming from uh, Chairman Kim to uh, President Hu Jintao. Uh, there had been certain promises from China to North Korea for economic support. However, they have been coming uh, slow uh, to North Korea. And I would think that Mr. Kim would be asking Hu Jintao for these economic supports to be sp speeded up so that uh, these things would be coming in faster. Uh, than what it was thus far. And as to the second topic, uh, I would think uh, President Hu Jintao would be asking uh, Chairman Kim to return to the six-party talks. Uh, there had been six-party talks uh, that's been stymied of late. And although we have had a joint statement, uh, the after effects had, have not been as uh, ap as successful as we had hoped for. So the relationship between North, North Korea and the U.S. have uh, gotten to a point where we require a more of a, uh, support from uh, Beijing, and Beijing would be asking North Korea to return uh, to the talks at a uh, faster pace. Thank you very much. Uh, right here. Yeah. Victor Lee from uh, China, China Society. And follow up with the question as uh, Kim uh, Jong-il visit China. It so, looks like he went to the southern part of China. So maybe they, for my guess, looks like they're really interested in some kind of uh, continuous economic reform and opening. So, so, but along this process, it seems like the people of North Korea will know more about the outside world, may kind of uh, uh, affect negatively their legitimacy. So what will be their strategy to really keep their legitimacy in the process of opening our economic reform? Kim Jong-il Jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il-jong-il
하나님 그 얘기를 여러 차례 했다는 것만 제가 말씀을 드립니다. As to the visit by Chairman Kim to the southern provinces uh, and also visits to the industrial facilities in the southern provinces, uh, if that is true, as it is reported by the media, uh, I am reminded of the event that had taken place a few years back when Chairman had visited Shanghai. Uh, I believe it was the Putong uh, region when he had visited. After he had come back from the visit to Putong region, uh, he had uh, directed his uh, subordinates for a research into the possibility of uh, having IT-based uh, uh, city uh, in the area of Shinoiju, uh, modeled after Putong region. And, uh, however, uh, as you know, uh, the economic uh, areas of Najin, Sambong, and Shinoiju, the plans have not gone as well as had, uh, had, uh, expe had been expected of by North Korea. So I would think uh, Chairman Kim's visit, if there had been one, uh, to the area in southern, southern provinces uh, would be f to seek help from China and also to uh, find a resolution uh, to the problems uh, that North Korea is facing in these economic regions. And as to the legitimacy question, uh, many scholars have differing views on that legitimacy question. And for now, I believe what is on, on the forefront of Chairman Kim's mind is the economic issues. And in the past, when I had discussed uh, the issue with the, the chairman, he did mention that his utmost goal at the time, at the time was uh, to make sure that the people of North Korea are well fed and that the economy is, is in prosperity. And of course, he does realize that there are certain changes that would be necessary on his part to accommodate the changes that are taking place on, on the economic front. However, he does realize that these are difficult uh, to achieve at the same time. And so I, I know he's uh, looking for ways to have all these things achieved at the same time. I'm not sure how soon they would, would be coming. Uh, however, all that uh, slow, they are steadily coming and the changes are being made. Very much. Second row. Param Miss <coughs> Warren from Ajans France Press. Uh, how has uh, South Korea China relations led to the deterioration of relations between South Korea and the United States? And how would the upcoming strategic dialogue between the two countries, beginning Thursday, lead to better relations? え、まあ、あの、こう、요즘、現実学者들と、政治学者들、え、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、いい、
all that we have increased uh, economic and possibly cultural exchanges between Ch China and uh, South Korea. I believe our relationship between South Korea and the U.S. remains strong, and I don't see how uh, the the current relationship that South Korea has with uh, China uh, could uh, weaken the relationship that we have uh, between South Korea and the U.S. This is a true alliance between the two countries, and I would think uh, in the next few years, uh, any concerns that you may have as to the possibility of weakening rela relationship between South Korea and the U.S. Uh, due to the uh, strengthening of, of uh, relationship between China and South Korea, uh, that concern should dissipate. Thank you. In the back, yes. Jung Sung Kim, Faculty of Economics at Bryant University. Um, not being a specialist on North Korean issues, um, I'm asking this question purely based on my personal curiosity. And um, I wonder if there is any um, um, any kind of measure that gauges the, um, the well-being of North Korean economy, for example, GDP. So if there is any official figures for this, and um, I'd like to know the, um, the current level of GDP in North Korea and um, the prospects, the projections in the next five and ten years. And uh, the reason I'm asking uh, this question is um, one of the most important uh, the problem we are facing at this point is the, um, the substantial wealth um, gap between North and South Korea, which is detrimental to unification, and, you know, definitely. Thank you. So, um, in your opinion, and um, what is the, um, the level or threshold of the, um, the GDP in North Korea um, at which we can seriously consider a potential unification? And, um, okay, let's, let's stop there. Maybe. Okay. Uh, 여기에 실은 그이이 uh, 방청석에 uh, 이 제가 통일부 장관 할 때에 아, 우리 경제에 총그 고문을 하던 분이 여기에 한분 네, 지금 와 계십니다. 에, 아마 그 분이 아마 더더잘 아실 겁니다. 많은 질문이 나왔기, 나왔기 때문에 제가 간단하게 답변해 드리면은 실은 지금 통계상으로 나온 지난해에 북한의 퍼 카피타 인감은 한 800불에서 900불입니다. 그리고 우리 어, 남쪽의 사우스 코리아는 14,000불입니다. 그러나 어, 잘 아시다시피 우리 통계는 믿을 만하지만 북한에 내놓은 이 오피셜 통계는 어, 50%를 디스카운트 해야 될는지 60%를 디스카운트 해야 모를. 그럼 저는 항시 어, 한 3분의 1로 봅니다. 그래서 한 300불 정도 아니겠는가 그렇게 생각을 하거든요. 근데 지금 제가 그 북한을 지난 7, 8년 동안에 왔다 갔다 하면서 들이다 보면은 아, 북한의 어떤 정확한 경제 통계를 내놓을 그런 여러 가지 여건이 안돼 있다고 생각합니다. 왜냐? 뭐 모든 그 자본면이라든지 또이 산업 시설면이라든지 그다음 인력면인데 모든 게 우리 그 서방 세계에 비하면은 너무 낙후돼 있고 뒤떨어져 있기 때문에 오히려 어, 비교를 못할 그런 정도다. 그렇게 제가 말씀을 드리고, 그러면 앞으로 어, 조금 전에 지적하다시피 참 통일로 위해서는 많은 뭐 여러 가지 문제 해결도 있겠습니다만 제일 큰 문제가 먹고 사는 문제. 이게 격차가 있어요. 적어도 지금 30대, 40대 1 차이에서 한 4대, 5대 1까지 근접해서 통일 얘기가 돼야지 지금 어떤 뭐 젊은 사람들 북에 왔다 갔다 하면 통일, 통일 인데 저는 만날 때마다 그분들한테 얘기하니까 제발 흥분하지 말라. 기다리라. 적어도 이 3대1 퍼스널 퍼카피타 인감이 비교가 되기 전 5대1 정도라도 됐을 때 얘기 되는 게좀더 실, 실제 뭐가 일 되는 거지. 지금은 그 북한도 아무도 거의 가능하다고 생각하지 않고 있다. 하는 얘기를 합니다. 그래서 훗날에 그는 통계, 이건 아마 모든 우리가 뭐 도와주고 뭐 행, 여러 가지 핵 문제 해결하고 미국도 도와주고 해가지고 좀 좋아졌을 때이 통계가 나오지 저 개인 생각으로는 지금 통계 내봐야 이거는 크게 우리가 참고할 만큼 못된다. 저는 그렇게 생각을 합니다. 짧게. Uh, we have uh, among us in the audience an economic ad advisor who had served under 
me when I had uh, worked as the uh, Minister of the uh, Unification. Uh, so I'm sure he has better idea as to these uh, statistics and numbers, uh, but since we do have a question pending from the audience, I will do my very best at this point. As to the per capita income from North Korea, it's been reported their per capita income for 2005, or strike 2005, last year had been $800 and $900 around there. And the per capita income for South Korea had been last year uh, $14,000. Now as to the uh, statistics, uh, our per capita income in South Korea, the numbers are quite reliable, but as to North Korean numbers, I am not sure if there is enough of a re reliability. Uh, sometimes we would discount their number by 50 to 60 percent to arrive at a more exact figure. In my personal view, uh, their figure would be more close to one-third of what they, what they have reported. So I would say the per capita income for North Korea last year had been $300 or so. And in the past seven to eight years, uh, since, since I have been traveling uh, to North Korea, I've looked at the North Korean economy uh, with my own eyes, and I realized that it, it is probably not feasible for North Korea to come up with hard figures, uh, possibly, uh, possibly because they don't have the infrastructure to actually come up with the figures that are uh, more proper or reliable. They don't have the capital necessary. They don't have the personnel necessary, etc. So I would say, comparison of the numbers or ind indexes are not possible at this point between South Korea and North Korea. And as to the unification and the possibility of uh, applying these numbers to the unification, I would say at, cu at current uh, we are 30 to 40 to 1. Uh, that's the ratio that we have, 30 or 40 to 1. And if there was to be any uh, unification talks between South and North Korea, realistically, I would say the ratio has to come down to about 4 or 5 to 1. So we have a lot of young people in, North, in South Korea clamoring for unification. However, I tell them that we need to be patient. We need to have these numbers to come down lower so that we could have a more real realistic chance at having a successful unification between the two two uh, countries. So at this point, the stats are probably not as helpful, although we could think of it as needing one. Uh, I think we need to have more uh, of a uh, improvement on both sides first, and then uh, we can talk about uh, these numbers in a more re re realistic manner. However, for now, the stat stats are not very meaningful. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, those were excellent questions, and I, I wish we had time for more. Copies of the speech are available and will be made available to all of you as you leave the auditorium. The speech will also be posted on the Wilson Center website, uh, and you can download it uh, from the website, and your colleagues can download it from the website in a few days. It will be posted soon. Um, thank you for coming. We look forward to seeing you in, at future events. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.